the Iliad. This is chapter one. This is where we left off at the end of E.V. Ryu's introduction. Here we are, chapter one, the quarrel. The wrath of Achilles is my theme, that fatal wrath, which, in full fulfillment of the will of Zeus, brought the Achaeans so much suffering and sent the gallant souls of many noblemen to Hades, leaving their bodies as carrion for the dogs and passing birds. Let us begin, goddess of song, with an angry parting that took place between Agamemnon, king of men, and the great Achilles, son of Peleus. Which of the gods was it that made them quarrel? It was Apollo, son of Zeus and Leto, who started the feud when he punished the king for his discourtesy to Chrysus, his priest. By inflicting a deadly plague on his army and destroying his men, Chrysus had come to the Achaean ships to recover his captured daughter. He brought with him a generous ransom and carried the chaplet of the archer god Apollo on a golden staff in his hand. He appealed to the whole Achaean army and most of all to its two commanders, the sons of Atreus. My lords, and you Achaean men-at-arms, you hope to sack King Priam's city and get home in safety. May the gods that live on Olympus grant your wish on this condition that you show your reverence for the archer god Apollo, son of Zeus, by accepting this ransom and releasing my daughter. The troops applauded. They wished to see the priest respected and the tempting ransom taken. But this was not at all to King Agamemnon's liking. He cautioned the man severely and rudely dismissed him. Old man, he said, do not let me catch you loitering by the hollow ships today, nor coming back again, or you will find the good staff and chaplet a very poor defense. Far from agreeing to set your daughter free, I intend her to grow old in profit of evil. Pardon me. In Argos, in my home, a long way from her own country, working at the loom and sharing my bed off with you now, and do not provoke me if you want to save your skin. The old man trembled and obeyed him. He went off without a word along the shore of the sounding sea, but when he found himself alone, he prayed fervently to King Apollo, son of Leto and the lovely locks. Hear me, God of the silver bow, protector of Chrysus and holy Scylla, the Lord supreme of Tenedos. Smithius, if ever I built you a shrine that delighted you, if ever I burnt you the fat thighs of a bull or a goat, grant me this wish. Let the Danans pay for your arrows, for my tears, with your arrows for my tears. Phoebus, Apollo, hearing his prayer, and came down in fury from the heights of Olympus with his bow and covered quiver on his back. As he set out, the arrows clanged on the shoulder of the angry god, and his descent was like nightfall. He sat down opposite the ships and shot an arrow with a dreadful twang. From his silver bow. He attacked the mules first and the nimble dogs. Then he aimed his sharp arrows at the men and struck again and again. Day and night, innumerable fires consumed the dead. For nine days, the gods' arrows rained on the camp. On the tenth, the troops were called to assembly by order of Achilles, a measure that the white-armed goddess Hare prompted him to take 
in her concern for the Danans whose destruction she was witnessing. When all had assembled and the gathering was complete, the great runner Achilles rose to address them. Agamemnon, my lord! What with the fighting and the plague, I fear that our strength will soon be so reduced that any of us who are not dead by then will be forced to give up the struggle and sail for home. But could we not consult a prophet or priest or even some interpreter of dreams, for dreams too are sent by Zeus, and find out from him why Phoebus Apollo is so angry with us? He may be offended at some broken vow or some failure of our rights. If so, he might accept a savory offering of sheep or a full-grown goats and save us from the plague. Achilles sat down, and Calchas, son of Thestor, rose to his feet. As an augur, Calchas had no rival in the camp, past, present, and future, held no secrets from him. And it was his second sight, a gift he owed to Apollo, that had guided the Achaean fleet to Ilium. He was a loyal Argive, and it was in this spirit that he took the floor. Achilles, he said, my royal lord, you have asked me to account for the archer king Apollo's wrath, and I will do so. But listen to me first. Will you swear to come forward and use all your eloquence and strength to protect me? I ask this of you, being well aware that I shall make an enemy of one whose authority is absolute among us and whose word is law to all Achaeans. A commoner is no match for a king whom he offends. Even if the king swallows his anger for the moment, he will nurse his grievance till the day when he can settle the account. Consider, then, whether you can guarantee my safety. Dismiss your fears, said the swift Achilles, and tell us anything you may have learnt from heaven, for my Apollo son for by Apollo, son of Zeus, the very god Calchas, in whose name you reveal your oracles, I swear that as long as I am alive and in possession of my senses, not a Danon of them all here by the hollow ships shall hurt you, not even if the man you mean is Agamemnon, who bears the title of our overlord. At last the worthy seer plucked up his courage and spoke out. There is no question, he said, of a broken vow or of any shortcoming in our rights. The god is angry because Agamemnon insulted his priest, refusing to take the ransom and free his daughter. That is the reason for our present sufferings and for those to come. The Archer King will not release us from this loathsome scourge till we give the bright-eyed lady back to her father without recompense or ransom and send holy offerings to Crisis. When that is done, we might induce him to relent. Calchas sat down and the noble son of Atreus, Imperial Agamemnon, leapt up in anger. His heart was seething with black passion, and his eyes were like points of flame. He rounded first on Calchas, full of menace. Prophet of evil, he cried. Never have you said a word to my advantage that is always trouble that you revel in foretelling. Not at once have you fulfilled the prophecy of something good you have. Never even made one. And now you hold forth as the army's seer tells them that the archer guard is persecuting them because I refused the ransom for the girl. Christ is princely, though it was. And why did I refuse? Because I chose to keep the girl and take her home. Indeed, I like her better than my consort. 
Clytemenstra. She is quite as beautiful and no less clever or skillful with her hands. Still, I am willing to give her up if that appears the wiser course. It is my desire to see my people safe and sound, not perishing like this. But you must let me have another prize at once, or I shall be the only one of us with empty hands. A most improper thing. You can see for yourselves that the prize I was given is on its way elsewhere. The swift and excellent Achilles leapt to his feet. And where? he asked. Does your majesty propose that our gallant troops should find a fresh prize to satisfy your unexampled greed? I have yet to hear of any public fund we have laid by. The plunder we took from captured towns has been distributed, and it is more than we can ask of the men to resemble that. No, give the girl back now, and the god demands, and we will make you triple, fourfold compensation if Zeus ever allows us to bring down the battlements of Troy. King Agamemnon took him up at once. You are a great man, Prince Achilles, but do not imagine you can trick me into that. I am not going to be outwitted or conjured by you. Give up the girl, you say, hoping I presume to keep your own prize safe. Do you expect me tamely to sit by while I am robbed? No. If the army is prepared to give me a fresh prize, choose to suit, chosen to suit my taste and to make up for my loss, I have no more to say. If not, I shall come and help myself to your prize, or that of Aeus, or I shall walk off from Odysseus's. And what an angry man I shall leave behind me. However... We can deal with all that later on. For the moment, let us run a black ship down into the friendly sea. Give her a special crew. Embark the animals for sacrifice. And put the girl herself, Crisis, of the lovely cheeks on board. And let some counselor of ours go as captain. Aeus, Idomenus. The excellent Odysseus, or yourself, my lord, the most redoubtable man we could choose to offer the sacrifice and win us back Apollo's favor. Achilles, the great runner, gave him a black look. You shameless schemer, he cried. Always aiming at a profitable deal, how can you expect any of the men to give you loyal service when you send them on a raid or into battle? It was no quarrel with the Trojan spearmen that brought me here to fight. They have never done me any harm. They have never lifted cow or horse of mine, nor ravaged many crop that the deep soil of Phythia grows to feed her men. For the roaring seas and many a dark range of mountains lie between us. The truth is that we joined the expedition to please you. Yes, you inconscionable cur. To get satisfaction from the Trojans, from Menelaus, and yourself. A fact that you utterly ignore. And now comes this threat from you of all people to rob me of my prize. My hard-earned prize. Mm, which was a tribute from the ranks. It is not as though I am ever given as much as you in the Achaean sack, some thriveling city of the Trojans. The heat and burden of the fighting fall on me, but when it comes to dealing out the loot, it is you that take the lion's share, leaving me to return exhausted from the field with something of my own, however small. So now I shall go back to Phythia. That is the best thing I can deal. To sail home in my beaked ships, I see no point in staying here to be insulted while I pile up wealth and luxuries for you. Take to your heels, by all means, Agamemnon, king of men, retorted. 
if you feel the urge to go. I am not begging you to stay on my account. There are others with me who will treat me with respect, and the counselor Zeus is first among them. Moreover, of all the princes here, you are the most disloyal to myself. To you, sedition, violence, and fighting are the breath of life. What if you are a great soldier? You made me. Who made you so but God? Go home now with your ships and your men-at-arms and rule the Myrmidons. I have no use for you. Your anger leaves me cold. But mark my words. In the same way as Phoebus Apollo is robbing me of Chryseis, whom I propose to send off in my ship with my own crew, I am going to pay a visit to your hut and take away the beautiful Briseis, your prize, Achilles, to let you know that I am more powerful than you, and to teach others not to bandy words with me and openly defy their king. This cut Achilles to the quick. In his shaggy breast, his heart was torn between two courses, whether to draw his sharp sword from his side, thrust his way through the crowd, and kill King Agamemnon, or to control himself and check the angry impulse. He was deep in, his, in, in this inward conflict, with his long sword half unsheathed when Athena came down to him from heaven. At the instance of the white-armed goddess Hare, who loved the two lords equally and was fretting for them both, Athena stood behind him and seized him by his golden law. No one but Achilles was aware of her. The rest saw nothing. He swung round in amazement, recognized Pallas Athena at once. So terrible was the brilliance of her eyes, and spoke out her. And spoke out to her boldly, "Why, why have you come here, daughter of the Aegis bearing Zeus?" Is it to witness the arrogance of my lord Agamemnon? I tell you bluntly, and I make no idle threats, that he stands to pay for this outrage with my with his life. I came from heaven, replied Athena, of the flashing eyes, in the hope of bringing you to your senses. It was Hare, goddess of the white arms, that sent me down. Loving the two of you as she does, and fretting for you both. Come now, give up this strife, and take your hand from your sword. Sting him with words instead, and tell him what you mean to do. Here is a prophecy for you. The day shall come when gifts three times as valuable as what you now have lost will be laid at your feet in payment for this outrage. Hold your hand then and be advised by us. Lady, replied Achilles, the great runner, when you two goddesses command, a man must obey, however angry he may be. Better for him if he does, the man who listens to the gods is listened to by them. And here, we're going to flip the rest of these pages. You can read on if you'd like on your own time. There you are. is the end of chapter one, the quarrel. The next time we'll pick up with chapter two, the forces are displayed. All for now.